wide across the sky. Behold, a love that never leaves us in the night. Come on and pray. Pastor Kel here, uh, just popping in for a few announcements. I understand that it is now after the new year, but guess what? The Christmas season doesn't end until Epiphany, so I got my ugly Christmas sweater on. Tara wore hers a few weeks back, and I got a little jealous that I never got to wear mine. So I'm wearing it today. We're hanging out with the deer. We're being festive. This is great. So a uh, couple of announcements uh, for this upcoming week. Uh, one is we are having some Christmas undecorating uh, up at the church this week. If you are interested in helping us undecorate for church or for Christmas, uh, we'd love it if you could contact Tara. Uh, her email is tara at h2oedge.org and I hopefully will edit it down right there. 
so you can see it. So um, <laughs> another thing uh, that we got going on at church right now is we all of our services are online due to the pandemic. Uh, we're hoping to be able to open up again soon, but we don't know when that will be. Right now we're following governor's orders and scientific recommendations, and so uh, we are just going to be continuing on like we are right now. And uh, finally, uh, if you were here last week, you heard this announcement. Uh, if you weren't, uh, just so you know, we are not doing children's ministry videos right now at the moment. Uh, when we moved over into the calendar year 2021, uh, we no longer have a children's minister position at, at Water's Edge. It was one of the hard decisions that we had to make financially, um, but we are hoping to get a couple of volunteers and retool a little bit in the month of January. If you could, if you are willing to help us with that, we would love to talk to you. You can email me, you can email Tara. That's all for me, and so now back to the worship service. Service. All right, I hope you can sing along with us. This is Canon. Falling from the clouds, a strange and lovely sound. I hear it in the thunder and the rain. It's ringing in the skies like cannons in the night. The music of the universe plays.
In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Welcome, everybody. It's a new year, 2021. And while we aren't in a drastically different place when we were, than we were in 20, when 2020 closed, uh, one of the things that we can have for this year is hope. Hope that things will be better. Hope that many of the things that we've been dealing with over this last year will maybe begin to ease up a little bit and, and hopefully go away. Hope that as, you know, that we as humans can maybe move in some better directions. But we also know that 2020 was just a doozy of a year, right? And many of us, we, we may have some baggage left over from everything that we've gone through, some baggage that we're carrying into this new year. Uh, what does that baggage look like? Well, for, for some people, 2020 was a year that saw that 
what they thought was a secure job situation, either that job completely went away or it was greatly reduced. Uh, so many people have had to figure out how the unemployment system works and, and have had to work things around just to make it just to make ends meet. And, and many people have had to pick up multiple jobs. And, and you can see the weariness on their faces just trying to make sure that the bills are paid. Um, that's some baggage right there. And, and it's not something that maybe is going to just get corrected because the calendar changes. For, for almost everybody in the world right now, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way that we live life. I'm preaching to an empty church right now, and it's weird, and we stay home more, and we cook more, and, and many people, many of us, we work from home, and, and the kids are going to school at home, and, and so we're finding that the world looks different without a ton of distractions. You know, a lot of things are just shut down. There's not new TV shows. You can't go to the movie theater. There's, you know, there's just, it, it's weird. Sports have shut, were shut down for quite a while in 2020. And even now they don't look the same. They don't feel the same. Professional athletes play to empty stadiums and arenas. Uh, we get regular updates on, on how people are getting sick. And so teams will have like just chunks of their lineup gone or they'll have to cancel or postpone a game. What we've been going through is just not normal, and so we're going to have some baggage from that. Um, some people are having to stay away from their families and their communities. For the first time ever, a lot of people probably celebrated Christmas and Thanksgiving without their loved ones, and, and we're seeing how some of the most vulnerable people in our population are leading us to make decisions to stay away. But we recognize that that's good because we don't want to spread the virus. We don't want to hurt one another. But there are still people that have gotten sick. There are still people that have lost loved ones. There are still people that are battling with this horrible disease and other horrible diseases that are out there. And this time period that we thought was going to last a few weeks has turned into months. We're fast approaching a whole year of dealing with this pandemic. And, and for much of this time, many people, they haven't seen their family. They haven't been in community there are some people that have been alone this whole time. It's hard. And you better believe that there's baggage because of that. But now it's a new year, right? And, and so we're thinking about this new year, and this is a time when we want to get better, right? This is a time that we want to be better. We want to work on ourselves. And, and let me tell you that it can be hard to move forward when we're carrying all this extra baggage from where we've been. So what do we need to do? What do we need to do to move forward? Well, I'm going to argue that we need to reboot. Now, for those of you that aren't very techie, a reboot is something that you do when your system isn't working well. There are sometimes maybe when your internet has really slowed down and, and you don't understand why, and, and so you call the tech support, and you're on the phone for like an hour and a half, and do, 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 you listen to the elevator music, and, and, and then finally you get to someone, they suggest, oh, we, all you need to do is reboot your modem. And so you go to wherever the modem is in your house and, you, you know, you have to get a pencil and you got to push the little, the, the stupid button on the back that's really, really tiny. Um, or this happens with computers too, right? Uh, you're working and, and all of a sudden on your laptop, you notice like 50 windows pop up and, and it, and it kind of just locks up and, and you're, you're trying to click and everything just slows way down. And, and, and you're like, oh, I can't work like this. I can't, well, you know, that you're hoping that the computer is going to catch up, but it just doesn't. And so you know that you need to reboot the computer. And now in the computer world, rebooting a computer is not really a big deal. You shut it off, you turn it back on. But what is actually happening when you do that is that the memory is resetting. The, the programs are being updated. Your hard drive, it spins around and it formats a little bit and it clears a little space and, and it compresses a tiny bit. And, and as your computer turns on again, it works a little faster because it's taken some of that baggage, all of those windows that were open, all of that stuff, that had, all that information that had been kind of getting stuck and it reboots it. It takes off the baggage and it works a little better. And so I want to do a series at the beginning of 2021 called Reboot, where we ask the question, if we wanted to do that, if we wanted to reboot our life, how would we accomplish it? And just in case you were wondering, 
There are many times in the Bible that something similar like this happens to someone who's living life. Think about Moses. Moses had grown up in the palace. He was a prince of Egypt. And then he murdered an Egyptian. And and people saw him do it. And so he became afraid. And so he ran away. He ran away into the wilderness. And so, um, and there in the wilderness, he met God at a burning bush. And all of a sudden, God reboots his entire life. No longer is he a prince of Egypt. Now he's a leader coming back to bring the people of God out of slavery in Egypt. He's there to save. He's there to rescue. Or how about the prophet Elijah who stood up against one of the most corrupt kings that has ever lived. And and when his life was threatened, he kind of did the same thing. He ran away. He went and he lived by himself at the Kareth Ravine. And there he was fed by ravens, like ravens were bringing him food and he drank at a stream. And he was there for weeks and months, possibly years, by himself, relying on God relying on these animals. And during that time, that's, that's what he did. But God used that time to reboot him. And when Elijah came back, he started performing miracle after miracle. And then he goes on to call fire down from heaven, showing one of the most powerful displays of faith in the Bible. I could go on and on about how people's lives were changed in an encounter with God. But what I'm more interested in today is how can we, how can you, how can I, after living this past year, reboot our own lives? How can we maybe start to sort through some of this baggage and leave it behind as we work towards a better 2021? We maybe don't have a burning bush, and maybe we don't have a Kareth Ravine, but maybe, just maybe, we can learn some lessons right where we are, and we can work on rebooting our own lives. And in doing so, ready ourselves for this coming year and the future. So, as we start this series, I think there is something that we all need to do. Before we even begin the process, we need to remember. That's right. So often I think that we are so worried about what is ahead and that we have a tendency to not ever look back. Every single history teacher that has ever lived has uttered the phrase, those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. And I think it's time we start to listen to them just a little bit. And and what that means is that remembering is important and that there are things that have happened before. And if we pay attention to them in our own lives and the history of the world, then possibly we'll be able to avoid some of the mistakes that have been made in our past. And maybe we'll be able to shed some of this baggage from 2020. The Bible takes a similar but different approach towards remembering than history teachers do. In the Bible, remembering is something that is active, something that we are called to. You know, it it has the the history factor, it has the learning factor to it as well, but it also, in many places, it's a command from God. God commands the people to write this down. God commands people to remember what has happened. It's almost as if God's like, hey, look, something important is about to happen. You need to remember this. One of those times where this happened was in the book of Exodus. And and I'm going to show you a verse from Exodus chapter 12. And what is about to happen here? is that the end of the 10 plagues in Egypt. You, you've probably heard the story before where Moses goes into Egypt and, and, and he's, he goes up to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. Let the Israelites go. They were slaves. They were the Pharaoh's slaves. And so the Pharaoh thought he owned these people. And, and so Moses goes up to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, why should I? He goes, because if you don't, plagues are going to happen and it's not going to be a good thing. So Moses brings on a plague until the Pharaoh says, no, 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 I don't want this anymore. This is really, really bad. And and so Pharaoh says, okay, I'll let the people go. And Moses says, okay. And then the plague goes away and then Pharaoh changes his mind. And so this happens nine times. This has happened nine times when you get to Exodus chapter 12. And so we get to chapter 12 and and there's this final warning. Like this plague is going to be worse than any plague that's happened before. You know, there's been flies, there's been gnats, there's been locusts, the sun has gone dark, the Nile has turned to blood. But what's about to happen is worse than all of that. 
Pharaoh, let my people go, or the spirit of death is going to come and visit all of Egypt. And when that happens, the firstborn of every household, the firstborn of every livestock is going to die. And so, the scriptures say that the Pharaoh's heart heart was hardened, and he said, no, I will not let the people go. And so Moses, being led by God, he goes back to the people, and and he tells them, all right, this is what's going to happen. The the, the spirit of death is going to come upon us. And and the people are like, oh, what are we going to do? And and so Moses tells them what to do. He says, go and sacrifice a lamb, spread the lamb's blood over the door and have a feast. But in this feast, you got to be ready to go because once this happens, Pharaoh's going to let us go and we are going to book it out of Egypt. And so like, don't put yeast in your bread. You won't have time to let it rise. And so this is exactly what happens. They, they, they sacrifice the lambs, they put it on the door frames and the spirit of death comes and visits Egypt. And there was a wailing in Egypt. It was, it was horrible. But before this happens, This is what God tells the people of Israel. This is verse 17 in Exodus 12. God tells them, celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. This is what God was calling the festival of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. So God is about to do this life-changing, world-changing thing. And what does God command the Israelites to do? God commands the Israelites to mark this day. If you go and you read all of chapter 12, you'll, you'll, you'll see that God actually commands them to set their calendar around this day, that, that the month that they were in was now to be their first month. In other words, their new year begins right now here. And, 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 and this day is to be honored. And on this day, they're supposed to celebrate a festival every single year so that they never forget what God did in this moment. Not only is God rebooting this community, but they are called to remember it, to celebrate it, to have a holiday every single year. And, and, and what God tells them is that holiday, it's supposed to be remembered as a lasting ordinance. Something that is celebrated not once, not 10 times, not for a generation, but forever. And let me tell you, this holiday that God commanded them, this feast of unleavened bread, you may not have heard of the feast of unleavened bread, but this was commanded by God to be done in the 13th century BCE. That means 1300 years before Christ. This was what God commanded to be, to be done. And now, today, Jewish families still celebrate this feast. They call it a Seder. They call it Passover. And I'm sure you've heard of that holiday. And every single year, they get together to remember what God did when God brought the people out of Egypt. But here's the lesson for us. God was about to change the Israelites' lives forever. They were about to go from slaves to free people. They were about to be made into a nation of their own, given their own laws and taught how to live. God was about to rescue them from the place where they had found themselves. But before that happened, God called them to remember this act, to remember what God was going to do, to write this down all over the scriptures. We see leaders, we see prophets, we see kings. We even see Jesus telling us to remember what God has done, to remember the ways of the Lord, to remember the covenant and the law, to remember that God brought the slaves out of Egypt. Remember, remember, remember. And so as we're looking forward, as we're looking at how we can release this baggage, as we're looking at how we can do a reboot, I think it's important for us to remember because this is something that God calls us to do. Now, how can it help us to reboot, to remember? Well, just like when a computer is rebooted, it remembers when life was good. That, it can have the same effect in our lives. We can remember a time when God 
felt near to us. Many people, they have these ups and downs in faith. Many people, they have these, these what are called spiritual highs or mountaintop experiences. Maybe they go on a mission trip or maybe they go to a really good Bible study or maybe they just have this time where they're meeting with people and, and they just fall in love with God all over again or, or maybe for the first time and, and, and they feel the spirit that's close. Those are wonderful times. Those are great times. But anybody that's lived with faith for a long time will know that there's ups, but there's also downs. That if we go through good times, but we also go through really difficult times. And so it can be helpful for us to remember those times when God felt near, when we're going through a really hard time. Because when we're going through a really hard time, it can feel like God is not near. And, and, and trust me, let me tell you this, God is not farther away from you, no matter what your situation. God is right there. God is forever and everlasting. God, God was, is, and is to come. God will be there forever for you. But there are times in life when it feels like God is near, and there's times in life when we go through really, really difficult times, and it feels like God is far away. When we remember the good times, it can help us it can sustain us through the more difficult times. When I was a brand new baby pastor <laughs> about, you know, 12, 15 years ago, um, I was encouraged by an older pastor to keep a notebook and, and in this notebook to put every letter, every card, every, you know, thoughtful note that I was given and, 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 to, and to keep that in your desk somewhere. Um, and the reason behind that was being a pastor is not always easy. There can be some really, really difficult times you go through as a pastor, but there can also be some really, really amazing times in being a pastor. And when that happens, people are so thankful that they'll, they'll give you notes, they'll give you presents, they'll give you gifts. And so uh, the, the suggestion was to keep all of that in a notebook. And then when the times are hard, to go back and look. Look through all those times. Why? Because remembering the good times, it helps us to re realize that not every day is going to be dark. Because that's what it feels like when you're going through a difficult time. When you're going through a difficult time, you can have a dark day and then another dark day and then another dark day, and it can start to feel like, oh my gosh, it's going to be dark for a long time. It's going to feel kind of like this pandemic has felt, right? Well, here's another day, another day of doing the pandemic, of wearing a mask, of, of living life this way, and, and it can feel like maybe this is just the way that it's always going to be, but when we remember when God felt near, when we remember those times in our life when faith and life was good, it can help us get through those difficult times because we know that it's not always going to be this way. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, though the sorrow may last for the night, joy comes in the morning. We may have some dark days ahead of us, but we also know that joy is coming. Why do we know that? Because joy has come. We know because God has worked in our lives before, and God will continue to work. Remembering can also have some practical purposes for us as well. I like to think of remembering as a teacher, right? It can teach us a lot of different things. Uh, one of the ways that, that it can teach us is it can teach us how far we've come. Uh, think about it. You haven't always been the person that you are right now. Uh, we all started as babies and children, and if, you've, if you're an adult and you're listening to this, you're not a baby, you're not a child anymore. You are not the same person that you were then. You're not even the same person that you were five years ago. But some of us, we have a tendency to get down on ourselves. We, we see our recent experiences, and we have a tendency to go, oh, I'm living a really bad life. Oh, I don't like where I am right now. Maybe this year you've put on the COVID-19, if you know what I'm talking about. Or, or maybe this year you're just not feeling like yourself because you know that you aren't in the community that you're used to. Uh, maybe you haven't been able to see people. Maybe you haven't been able to see family. But remember, when we remember when, where we've been, it can help us to see how far we've come. It can also help us to put into perspective where we are. I remember that there was a time, and this was earlier on in my career as a pastor, um, 
my family had moved to Grand Rapids. We had bought a house. We had put everything that we had into a church plant in Grand Rapids, and it just failed. And it was one of the most difficult times in our marriage. It was one of the most difficult times in our lives because all of a sudden, like, uh, the domination pulled the plug on this church plant. I was kind of working part-time uh, for the church, but I, I didn't really have any, it, much to do. And so they actually told me, hey, go get a job out in the community. And so I was waiting tables at Carabas. You know, I was, I, I was a waiter, and I was just trying to make ends meet. We had just had a baby, and so we had this young baby at home, and and I'm working just part-time, and, and, and we are just living paycheck to paycheck. And, and, and it was a scary time because, I mean, we were basically living on credit cards and tips. And, and, and you know, it was just this really, really difficult time. And when I remember that, I remember how far we've come, where we are now where life is. And, and, and I'm sure maybe you have a similar story in your life, not to say that what we're going through isn't difficult, not to say that, that you, you know, where we are is just roses and sunshine, because it may not be. This might be one of the more difficult times, but it can always help us to remember how things have been in the past. Because if things were harder then, then we have grown. We have grown to where we are. And so, and it can really help us to remember that. And, and I mentioned this earlier, but it can also give us this perspective. It gives us a perspective about where we are today and how today is truly different. Um, we might have a tendency to think of ourselves and be really disappointed about where we are right now. Because 2020 was such a difficult year and, and it brought so many people down to their knees. But if we look back and we remember what's happened in the past, we have an opportunity to make a fair comparison about what's going on. To give a really silly example, uh, the, the, the end of the year in church world means that we uh, take stock of the previous year. And so we, we review our finances of the previous year. And one of the hilarious things that we're going to do this year is we're going to review church attendance for 2020. And now, in most years, you know, we have a week or two where attendance just really goes down. And, you know, and it's because a snowstorm comes through, like maybe we have a blizzard. And so like, we'll have like nine people at a church service uh, because there's like a foot and a half of snow on the ground uh, that happened all that morning. And so the roads are awful, but 2020 is unprecedented. We're going to have, you know, eight months of closed church, it, you know, like where people haven't come to the building. And so we're going to have to find new ways to count. We're going to be counting page views instead of handshakes. We're going to be, you know, you, normally we count the people that come into the building and, and we just can't do that this year because otherwise it's going to look abysmal. And so what we have to do is we have to look back but then we have to make a fair assessment about where we are. And, and we do that in the church, but you can also do it in your life. 2020 could have just been the worst year for you. But that doesn't mean that it's always going to be 2020 now for the rest of forever. You can remember 2019. Maybe you can remember a time when life was better. And so... That's kind of the challenge where we are right now. As we're looking at rebooting our lives, as we're looking at kind of taking some of that baggage away, looking back can help us to know what we need more of and what we need less of. Uh, comparing, you know, and taking a real good look at what happened in 2020 and the years previous and where we are today, it can help us to know maybe, okay, I need to do more of this and I need to do less of this. Now, I don't know what that is for you, but it might be good to really think about it. Now, the last thing that I wanted to bring up today when it comes to remembering, and, and this is the big one, and, and what I want to do is I just want to tell it to you and then I want to break it down. Remembering grounds us. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, remembering has this way of helping us to feel, helping us to know, helping to surround ourselves with what is true. We've talked about all of these types of things kind of so far in this sermon, but my opinion is that this is probably the most powerful thing that remembering can do. It can ground us in the truth. 
And we get this from Jesus. We get this from faith. Today, I'm shooting this video. I'm not on the stage. The stage is kind of over there. I've actually pointed the camera into the corner. And if you'll notice, I'm in the corner because this is the table. This is where we do communion. And I wanted to use this backdrop today because in, in so many ways, communion is the perfect example of what, remember, what the power of remembering can do in our lives. Communion is this thing that grounds our faith. And it's the one thing that if Jesus was really serious, he outright said, do this in remembrance of me. Every time we go through the liturgy of communion, we say these words. We say, on the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread. He gave thanks to God. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. Take, he said, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. And then here's the words, hear the words of Jesus. Do this in remembrance of me. And when they ate, he took the cup and he gave thanks to God again, and he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And then we say, we all say this together, we say, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. In other words, we are remembering what Jesus did for us. When we take communion, we are remembering that something that actually happened, words that Jesus said to his disciples. We are remembering, you know, what Jesus was teaching them in those private moments and, and, and what he was doing. And you got to realize that they were remembering themselves. They, they were a part of a Passover meal. This was a Seder meal that they were celebrating. Remember that passage from the Exodus that we talked about where they're supposed to remember this in perpetuity? Like, that's what's going on at the Last Supper. And so at the Last Supper, Jesus, he, he takes these familiar things that they would know, have known from their childhood, this bread and this wine, and he gives them new meaning. This bread that was supposed to represent the bricks that their ancestors made, no longer would it represent bricks. Now it represents sacrifice, his body that is broken for you. And then he takes the cup, the wine, the fruit of the vine that is supposed to represent, you know, various aspects. There were four cups throughout the meal that they would eat. And, and so he, he took the cup, the fruit of the vine, and he said, take, drink from this. No longer is it the fruit. Now it is my blood. And this blood will cut a new covenant between you and me, between God and us. And what that new covenant means is that no longer will we be bound to the law. No longer will we be under the covenant that, that focuses in on following the rules and, and, and sin and, and covering that sin. No, no, no. This covenant is a new covenant and it is bound in love. It is bound in faith. And notice he doesn't point people away. He points people and he says, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus points his disciples to himself. When we take communion, we remember the mighty acts of Jesus. We remember the sacrifice of Jesus for us on the cross. We remember the power that he had, but then laid down so that we might have life. Friends, can I just tell you, I miss meeting together. <laughs> I miss you. I miss the community. I miss the shaking hands, the coffee, everything. I miss the breakfast, the conversations. I miss taking communion with you. But one of the things that we can do is we can remember. And I would argue that this is probably one of the most important things that we can do. As we're looking at shedding baggage, as we're looking at 2021, as we're looking at moving forward, I would argue that we could all use a healthy dose of remembrance in our life. And I pray that as we remember, as we celebrate our faith, as we are still in the midst of the Christmas time, 
celebrating the birth of Jesus, I pray that you would be grounded in the remembrance of what God has done for you and of the love and the grace and the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. And so this week, here's my challenge for you. Take some time. Uh, See if you can find some time by yourself If you have some journals that maybe you've kept over the years, now would be a good time to maybe go back through those journals and read about where you've been and what you've done. And if you don't have journals, that's okay. Go back and remember your life. Go back and remember maybe some times where God was there and maybe you didn't even realize it. Go back and remember how God has worked in your life. And then come back next week as we learn more about how to reboot ourselves for 2021. Will you pray with me? God, I pray right now. I pray for your love. I pray for your peace. I pray for your grace to be upon us all, God. I I pray that in this message, in this time, as we come into this new year, that we would ever focus, ever be grounded in you. God, that you would help us to know of your love that you would help us to realize how near you are to us. God, you love us. You sent your son to die for us. God, help us to know ever more deeply the love of your son, the love of Jesus in our lives. And God, may we never forget. Instead, help us to remember. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
of the goodness of God. Yes, we will, Lord. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. That's my prayer, friends, that as we leave this place, we're just singing of the goodness of God, that we're lifting our hearts and our voices to him through our weeks as we move on, keeping each other in prayer, keeping our leadership of the church in prayer, keeping our country and our world in prayer. Praises to him and love from us. See you next time.